Welcome, everybody. This is the May 25th general meeting for the Hyperledger Healthcare um, Special Interest Group. And we are joined by our audience and guests, and we will dive in today into a few different industry news and interesting projects that I found over the last uh, few weeks. Um, before we get started there, I just wanted to make sure we gave everyone who's new here an opportunity to introduce themselves, share what they're working on, perhaps uh, maybe ask some questions. So if there's anybody here that would like to do that, please raise your hand in the Zoom and we can just quickly call on you just so everyone is familiar with who you are. Many looks like um, have been on the uh, meeting before. So I'll give a second hold here just to wait. Okay, so um, no introductions, that's okay. So does anyone have any announcements or community information they would like to share? Okay. Um, um, mm -hmm. If I Go could, uh, I'll offer. Um, so I wasn't sure if anyone will be attending the Drug Information Association conference, a uh, big annual conference in June. Um, but I serve on the planning committee for that conference and it was, it's really exciting that this is the first year that blockchain is considered a priority focus within the data, data management track. And I will actually get to be speaking. Um, I'm gonna actually be talking about data as an asset with kind of just flavors of blockchain, but I, I thought it was meaningful that uh, there's much more interest in, the, in pharma about how best to pursue blockchain so much so that they're making it a priority focus um, for DIA. So if, um, if any of you are gonna be at DIA in Chicago, please do let me know. I'd love to see you there in person. Thanks for sharing that, Wendy. And I'd love to actually include it here in the upcoming events section. So if you wanna send Great. a link, that would be awesome. Okay. Um, and then I can add it. So if anyone happens to, um, take a look at this page, they can find that too. So thank you. Yes, I probably should have waited until then. <laughs> no, that's great. No, I, I'm okay. glad that was perfect. Um, and just as a reminder, this is a recorded event, so this will be public. So if there's anything you don't wanna share publicly, please don't share it here. <laughs> okay, um, so actually that's a good segue into these upcoming events. As a reminder, everybody, there's the Science of Blockchain event in Stanford, August 29th to the 31st. Um, there's also Consensus 2022, which is by Coindesk, and it's called the Festival for the Decentralized World. There's also, and I could open this up for everyone here. If you haven't seen this, it's a major conference. Uh, many speakers, many sponsors, full agenda, different topics. I don't think there's specific sections on healthcare, but I'm sure there are people there who will be focused on healthcare to some degree. So it's an interesting one to check out. Uh, and there will be actually on June 10th, a uh, how decentralization will reinvent healthcare is hosted by Decentratech collective community member, um, Pete Harris. So you can check that out. All right. Uh, so those are the events. Thanks for the quick uh, comments in the beginning, everybody. We're going to dive into some of the industry news that came up in the last few weeks. So the first one that I thought was quite interesting was Instagram starting to support NFTs. This is pretty major, I think, because NFTs have been in the last year or so have gotten some um, notoriety, I would say. Many expensive NFTs, seemingly for no reason, uh, but, you know, this trend I think is continuing to grow and supported by Instagram's support really. So I'm sure there've been updates since this article um, from the meta company, but does anyone have any thoughts on this or just comments or opinions about what's happening with Instagram and NFTs? Ray is Kirit here. Do we know what they're actually going to show? Have we got like a preview? Is it going to be like a link to the Ethereum or public blockchain or whatever? If it's on Solana, like 
Do you have any idea what it's going to look like? Or... Well, it, they did say it'll be supported by the Ethereum and Solana blockchains, I believe, and Polygon and also Flow. Yeah. So maybe maybe a transaction with transaction or something with, with the image. I don't know how else that would work. It'd be interesting to see what it looks like. Yeah, I don't. That's a good question. So it says they won't be charging users for showcasing their art. But um, what about, you know, minting art? Would they charge for that? I'm, I wasn't clear. Oh, yeah. I didn't think about that. So I, I think we'll have to see. Um, but this is, you know, definitely a, a trend in like a positive direction for NFTs, at least. So we'll see. And I'm sure it's going to come up again. <laughs> you know, a meta has been really focus on the metaverse and yeah, it should be interesting to, to follow this one. Yeah. Along those lines, um, I, I don't have a lot of knowledge, but I've been interested in the development of using intellectual prop, uh, managing intellectual property with NFTs. Um, actually a piece of my presentation at DIA is using NFTs to recognize data ownership and assets. And I was curious if any of you are involved in that or can speak more knowledgeably than I could about um, uh, NFTs for managing intellectual property, including publications and such. Yeah, so Wendy, I've seen a lot of activity in like the decentralized science space regarding IP oh, NFTs. Okay. So like that has been um, a major you know, point of conversation, I would say. Now, does has anybody defended their intellectual property that has been tokenized? Let's say I don't know about that, so I haven't seen any like cases, uh, legal cases around that. It'll happen, I think. I, I just I don't know when exactly or how, but um, yeah, that's an interesting question. Anyone else? Okay. It looks like Curate yeah. has his hand up, and I think yeah, there was a there was a conference that I was supposed to watch on YouTube. It was D Side Berlin, and it had like all of the DAOs and molecules featured as one of those. So I think you'll be able to find some more information um, on on those live streams. So I'll try and get them and ping, ping them over to you. Yeah, thanks for sharing thank that. Doug, um, for posting that link about the Wall Street Journal, I read that article in the paper and. It really made an impact on me. Um, I was concerned too that with the sales flattening that there would be um, kind of a loss of momentum, but I, I don't know what you know the future will hold. I'm eager to hear what you thought when you read the article. The Wall Street Journal article or the... Yes, the Wall Street yeah, Journal Sorry article. if I'm mute. The, um, yeah. I, I don't know what to think of it. It's you know the dialectic reasoning in me. So there's an antithesis to any thesis and the whether or not this is a, whether that article is asserting a bubble. Um, I think anybody looking at it would say it's got to there's got to be more to it than bored apes and you know silly art. There's got to be uh, it must be some more serious use cases that are emerging or it will be a bubble and. Mm -hmm. No, I'm not sure what they are yet. If you just look at NFTs as just composable kind of containers for, um, in our case, health records, for example, um, that's interesting. But I'm not aware of that of that making it kind of to the frontier, let alone the main flow yet. So yeah, it's a, it's it's an interesting technology. Um, I don't know whether it's it's certainly not quite ready for prime time, but if it's the, whether it's the future is, you know, something that we'll all keep our eye on. Yes. And Wendy, you were referring to this article. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Yes, I would open it, but it looks really like they have a paywall. To read it, yeah, I have, um, I, I have membership to the Wall Street Journal. And so if anyone wants to read it, just ping me within the, um, chat and I can log into my account and make a PDF of the article. Thank you. That's so nice. Appreciate that. All right. I'm going to go to the next. We have a bunch of articles here. So uh, this one was from CNBC. It says Google's cloud group forms Web3 team to capitalize on booming popularity of crypto. 
I thought this was interesting to see Google, one of the major data and search companies, um, cloud and they do many things, but um, they are starting to focus on Web3. Uh, I saw here Google wants to offer backend services to developers interested in composing their own Web3 software as the company battles for market share in cloud infrastructure against Alibaba, Amazon, and Microsoft. It specifically says, or um, we're not trying to be to be part of the that cryptocurrency wave directly. So I guess they are the like the shovels um, in this in this gold mine, gold rush, not the um, gold dealers. Let's say. <laughs> um, I didn't read this article, but I keep I'm always in search of a common definition that most people would accept is what the hell is web three exactly um is it does it have to do with nfts cryptocurrencies etc is it is it more to do with decentralization is it as simple as saying you know web the web was about reading web two about writing web three about owning i don't know i mean there's if anybody has a you know authoritative definition of web three Please post it. <laughs> That's a good point. And I don't think we'll ever reach that final absolute definition. I think it's something like, you know, what is the internet? There's different definitions. It's slightly mm. um, variable, but I think essentially like owning your data. And here it says um, in building our in-house team for Web3 tools, Google is taking its next step to prove its commitment to the market. Um, Well, within the healthcare space, I would be, I'm just naturally dubious about any contention Google would make about decentralization. Yeah. They're the, they're the consummate, you know, quintessential centralized architecture. And um, they've got, a, I don't know, I don't, I'm not sure what, what shovels they have to, to sell <laughs> that store. Okay, agree that. Say again, yeah. Johan. I, you... I totally agree with what he said. Yeah. Wendy? Oh, I was going to share with Doug, everything that you mentioned about Web3 is considered part of the current discussion. And I think you're totally on the right track. And I also agree, um, this is something that uh, we're seeing a lot more momentum toward, but there's not a consensus yet of what it actually means. And I'm likening back to, um, I serve on uh, an IEEE governance committee for blockchain. And we have had the most heated debates about even the definition of what blockchain is. In fact, um, there's a joke in the blockchain community. I think I've said it on this forum before that if you ask 10 different blockchain experts for a definition of blockchain, you will receive 11 different definitions. I, I think the same is true with Web3. So we're, we're going um, to we're going to provide more education, but I don't know if we're going to reach consensus in any time soon. Agreed. Next up, actually, as long as it means everything, it means nothing. That's the problem. That's probably true. Well, actually, I agree with you, but I think once the applications or once there's like a, you know, an application that's actually useful for people, they really won't care what the definition of Web3 is, as long as they get the utility or benefits out of, uh, you know, that technologies, those technologies. Um, it's my opinion. Uh, this is an article from Entrepreneur, actually. I thought it was pretty cool because they talk about the next frontier of healthcare. They mention blockchain, AR, and VR. So they specifically talk about blockchain uh, in the way that, you know, it allows for cryptocurrencies for borderless payments and security. Um, a lot of ads here. And they mention how the plastic surgery industry is booming, but there are many people or patients that are trying to keep um, their privacy and confidentiality around those procedures. So payment with like a cryptocurrency that's private could help with that. I thought it was pretty interesting that they mentioned that here. And they specifically talk about how in the Middle East, that's a very uh, 
I guess, important thing. Um, let's see here. They also talk about just transparency in general. So are there a number of flaws in the medical industry, healthcare, hierarchy, data ownership, and data security? As we know, blockchain is quickly becoming a critical need for the digitization of healthcare. Um, it can allow decentralized communities controlled democratically via smart contracts, meaning that everyone has a record of what happened in the digital world. This does all kind of still sound like what was talked about in 2017 and 18 about how blockchain can revolutionize healthcare. So it's very much very almost similar, the conversations. However, you know, it's still being reinforced. So we haven't lost um, that dream, I guess. And I see that Jim raised his hand. Jim, you want to say something? Sure. Yeah. I, I mean, you always do a great job, Ray, in pulling together these articles and talking about these topics. But I always enjoy ones like this in particular because they're perfect examples where the author have no understanding of the community that they're writing about. Because number one, pointing out the transparency of blockchain for my healthcare records is not exactly something I'm all that thrilled about. And then second of all, the idea of leveraging cryptocurrency for cross-border pay payments for plastic surgery and medical tourism sounds fine in its cup, except that we have more and more real examples, especially like El Salvador, where fluctuation in cryptocurrency prices greatly and dramatically changes the prices of services. So if I'm going to price something in, in Bitcoin, is it going to be tethered to the Bitcoin price, which fluctuates with uh, the US dollar? Or is it going to be tethered to the US dollar, which case then you have other problems about the cryptocurrencies that you're accepting. So I'm not quite sure what they're trying to get at from a healthcare perspective. Right. And I do think this is for like a much more broader audience. This is entrepreneurs. So as many, I guess, people that are not really in healthcare or maybe blockchain at all. And this is sort of like their first time seeing it. So, and they do include AR, VR as part of this uh, article. I'll add on the AR, VR side that, that we're setting up in LFPH um, something of a practice area or a community of practice around AR and VR and digital therapeutics. Um, just to give a plug, the Linux Foundation also hosts the Open 3D Foundation, which has every big name tech company you can think of in AR and VR and, and mobile gaming and is moving as an industry to um, open source engines for those components. And then there's digital therapeutics, which is the industry group associated with AR and VR and digital solutions for healthcare as FDA approved therapeutic treatments. Um, interesting comments I got from a company called Applied VR that I was chatting with that's a member of, of the Digital Therapeutics Alliance. And they said when they do work with things like um, um, uh, Oculus 2 and the others, there's a lot of parts of the underlying AR in, VR engine they have to rip out in order to apply for AR and VR because AR and VR, even in open source, is coded towards a customer experience for gamers who are you know, inherently technical, understand the look and feel, can move from one platform to another. You know, For a digital therapeutic solution in AR and VR, it has to be something that a 72-year-old Medicare recipient can understand when they go to turn it on or how to use it. Um, and, and that is still kind of a significant um, schism in AR and VR tech as we understand, as, as the folks on this call are used to it and what you do for applying it to healthcare as a digital therapeutic. And if they don't mention the digital therapeutics process in the article, they kind of missed out too. So. Yeah. And I also think, you know, looking at Apple's announcement of their new headset, or I think it was a rumor, I'm not sure, but that's still, we still need to have those devices way more user-friendly, especially for those older people. So I'm with you. All right. The next article here by Forbes and... Let's see here. How Web3, um, all right, how, okay. Thought I had this, apologies. Okay, so basically I talk about how Web3 is going to, again, decentralize healthcare. Um, talk about distributed ledgers as, you know, a way that data, the data infrastructure can be stored for healthcare as well. Um, talk about 
the base healthcare applications for Web3 is remaking EHRs. That's what they're saying. And I thought this was interesting too. Again, not a surprise to much of, you know, most of us here, um, but, and I'm sorry, I can't show it because I'm, I'm using an ad blocker. Maybe I'll turn it off for this website. Yeah, there you go. So many ads, right? Can blockchain fix this? <laughs> um, so any thoughts on this article, if anyone had a chance to read it? And I like this final comment here. It says, are we there yet? The truth is we are not at Web 3.0 yet, and we will not get there anytime soon. Plus, in a practical sense, it's less about Web 3 supplanting Web 2 and more about Web 2 becoming incorporated into Web 3. And I think that's really a good point. Uh, nonetheless, for a long time, Web 3 and its decentralized model have only been theoretical, but now people are beginning to believe in it and build a surge of momentum to create it. And it says, ignore it at your own risk. Johan? Yes, I just wanted to share my um, thoughts on the article. And uh, I think Web 3.0 is uh, really the way forward. Uh, but uh, it will take a lot of extreme uh, investments and it will take a lot of time. Where I'm coming from is that um, basically you need to understand the entire complexity of the healthcare system. And you need to understand how the government, the regulations, and uh, how people interact in order to, to really scale this. And uh, where I'm coming from is basically I, I co founded a telemedicine business in, in India in 2016. And uh, what we saw there was that uh, uh, the doctor to patient ratio in India is, uh, yeah, it's uh, compared to the US, uh, you have like one doctor for 10,000 people, something like that, back in those days. And that's where I can see that the technology can really make a difference. But when it comes to Web 3.0, I, I see that you need to really understand how all the players can interact and that will take a long time. But the good thing is that the technology, I believe is already here, but uh, for people to really uh, take it and to see that the value is the privacy. In my book, at least it's the, the value of privacy. That's what will drive the web 3.0 uh, development. And I think that uh, what happened with, I would say, Facebook last year when the data privacy and all of that, and what Google is doing with uh, selling user data, all of this would fuse. So I think that uh, it will probably take five to 10 years. And that's my estimate before we can really see that Web 3.0 in healthcare uh, is making um, progress. So I just want to share my, my thoughts on that. Yeah, thank you for sharing. I uh, appreciate that. And, you know, you make a good point. I think there is this need for privacy, but it isn't um, something everyone shares. I think a lot of people don't care still. They don't understand the value of their privacy or their data in general. That's part of the education process, I think. And as we generate more data, that part will be more important and people will realize, you know, why that's important. I think we'll see. Any other comments on that uh, article? All right, jumping to the next one here. And this is an article from lifespan.io which is uh, crowdsourcing the cure for aging. So this is a longevity life expansion um, type of site. And they write biotechnology DAOs for facilitating development. So in this article here, they asked, you know, what are biotech DAOs? And for those that may not know here, biotech DAOs are a subcategory of DSI. These DAOs use their decentralized autonomous format to bring individuals together in order to solve healthcare and other challenges using biotechnology. 
So how does it work? Uh, I won't get into all of this, but basically you have a community with a mission and values. Um, you have members of the DAO and they may come from different backgrounds. They establish rules and governance and then they typically have here, it says this, um, you know, the rules are run by smart contracts. These rules are visible to the whole community and written onto the blockchain. Next, the DAO decides on its funding and governance structure. Um, this is generally through issuing native tokens in exchange for fiat currency to raise funds. These tokens give members voting rights. To date, there's no singular agreement of the best governance method or token voting rights structure. It's a really good point because there's so many experiments out there. Below are some of those notable biotech DAOs like Vita DAO, Lab DAO, Psy DAO, Genomes DAO, Cures DAO, uh, Entitote DAO, Molecule, Cynet. So this, these are you know all experiments at this point, and they have gotten some pretty good traction. It's I guess time will tell how um, revolutionary, how much they revolutionize this industry. I think they will. I'm not sure when, but I think that will it will happen eventually, um, just because it, you know, the new model makes more sense than the previous model. Um, any thoughts on this? And I will say, many of these, many of the DAOs, D side DAOs that are out there, are at least, you know, ancillarily focused on longevity and life extension. So that, that I think that's interesting. Okay. Uh, the next article I have here is an announcement of a partnership between a Polygon and MSP. So MSP recovery says here, uh, Polygon Networks, a leading blockchain and scaling solution, announced partnership with Tokenology and MSP Recovery to deliver LifeChain, a new healthcare claims platform. Has anyone heard of MS Recovery or LifeChain before? It says LifeChain will leverage blockchain to solve the biggest healthcare problems, including fraud, inefficiency in payments, and antiquated processes. Excellent. I hope so. Uh, life chain life chain will be developed by msp recovery and tokenology as a fully tokenized medicare medicaid and commercials claims recovery system protected by biometric security um, the platform is designed to solve significant problems the healthcare industry faces um, so life chain will be integrated with msp's recovery uh commercial application life wallet it's a tool designed to allow individuals to access medical history and life-saving resources while providing interconnectivity for providers or with providers who also gain important resources from the platform um, so i don't know much about this organization but you know i thought it was interesting that you know they made this announcement so we'll continue to watch this and see where it goes Hey, right. So uh, I looked into this a little bit when you sent uh, out the agenda yesterday. Um, so it looks like they're like mostly deal with medical claims in the secondary market. Uh, they have like a trillion dollar in uh, medical claims. Um, so I just thought it was interesting that since they're mostly dealing with the secondary market, that they have this life wallet that uh, consumers that I'm assuming they're going to hope consumers on board to. Um, so I wonder if that's going to be a challenge for them. Because if they're mostly dealing with this whole uh, secondary market and how do they uh, then interact, do they have consumers or, or where are these patients coming from? But definitely interesting that they're using Polygon. It seems like the best choice of, the, of layer two. Um, so yeah, definitely an interesting article. Yeah, and I didn't, I'm, I didn't know about the secondary market part of that. So it might've been in the article, I'm not sure, but... Um, I wonder, does anyone know if the secondary claims or insurance market is larger than the primary or maybe just help define that a little bit more? Because I'm not too familiar with that myself.
No, that's okay. Yeah, I got to be honest. I'm not exactly sure what the secondary market is. Yeah, that, that might have been, been a different article when I was <laughs> looking into it, but well, it could be. It, I'm just guessing, but it could be they're referring to Part C, you know, uh, Medicare Advantage supplemental insurance. Yeah, so, that's true. Yeah, so in which case it's pretty big, but it's um, not bigger. Yeah, I'm reading here on on the side. There's nothing about this press release that necessarily suggests they talk to anyone in healthcare claims at all. <laughs> in this article, right? Yeah, that's true. Well, MSP Recovery, just to quickly check their website out. Uh, investors, that's a major thing. So they are a public company, looks like. I don't know. We'll have to watch and wait, I guess. Wait and watch. Life Wallet, register now. They have an application. Benefit Solutions. Yeah, okay. Looks pretty interesting. All right. I'm going to jump to our next article here. Thanks for that. those comments, guys. All right. So this one, Stat News. I thought this was pretty interesting too. And it's titled How a Complex Web of Businesses Turned Private Health Records from GE into a Lucrative Portrait of Patients. So this was a, a tale that I read yesterday or a couple of days ago about how GE and Quintiles, now known as um, IQVIA, basically handled millions of patient records, data records, and now they're sort of being shared amongst different companies and people are profiting off our patient data. So um, this is an important tale for anyone in the Web3 healthcare space. I think this is sort of what we're trying to prevent by building decentralized networks and, and systems. And um, so I'll read a few comments here. Um, it created an environment with limited oversight a uh, privacy expert said. Uh, and now with every app download, website visit, and social media post, patients are creating even more data that private companies can buy and use to shred HIPAA's protections. Uh, the data can be legally de-identified under HIPAA, but in the real world, it is not de-identified because it can easily be re-identified. This is something we've heard for quite a number of years now that so-called de-identified data based on the standards or protocols that were used back like, I think like 10 or 20 years ago, um, the process that they took to de-identify data, they remove, you know, name, age, specific, maybe zip code or other things that can identify you. Even if you take those out, there are ways to use other data to identify the person uh, and then they could follow you and advertise to you and other things as well. So and the expert from John Hopkins said holes in the, he said, uh, holes in the law are allowing companies to trade on de-identified data in ways that are certainly not appropriate or ethical. So this is happening now, guys. <laughs> I know this occurrence or this situation with GE and quintiles happened years ago, like kind of like decades ago, kind of that's when it started. Um, but this is happening now and probably more than we even realize. I think it's important that, you know, we keep fighting the fight against this. Um, any comments on, on this article, if you guys have seen it? Right, do you have a stat subscription? Because it's behind the paywall when I try and check it out. Yes, I do. But I'm happy if anyone wants to send me an email, I can just, uh, I will be able to... Um, share this with you just for for this article at least yeah that's great to know ray yes um i'll put a little note in the chat i'd love to see that yeah so i suppose true. it's not surprising so your genomic information is not a you know whatever the 18 safe harbor elements that um it was defined you know with 20 years ago 
and your genomics really is like your whole genome is your ultimate identifier. Uh, so, and that's not covered. So makes sense. When I, when I was at Vanderbilt, there was a study of um, attempting to re-identify people based on biomarkers in their, um, like your CBC or chemistry panel. Um, so, and uh, that was, it was totally doable. So. Yeah, Jonathan nailed it. I mean, we've, we have article after article after article after article about data brokers and, and even just the structure of de-identified data, which relates back to the 1996 data model. And um, it just hasn't been updated yet. And, and it was never envisioned to collect the voluminous, not, not only collect information from a de-identified HIPAA compliant EHR system, but the tremendous volume of information that's available from other data brokers that you can just buy, you know, for commercial purposes and then match up with that data. Well, also tagging this back to the previous comments about Google, um, it, it could be that this is a, it's a very acute problem, but it might even be a transient one in that um, the, the provider community in America has pushed back hard on this. Um, the leading AMCs and whatnot are, are raising a stink over it, but the government of England, the UK government has actually filed suit against Google's um, use of so-called de-identified data. So it's, it's a very pregnant problem um, that might be being addressed in the courts pretty soon anyway. Yeah, that's very, Good comments and i suppose it goes, just goes also goes back to uh, a mantra that i say uh is that identity is a process of reconciling identifiers the more unique identifiers you have the more the ability to reconcile and perform identif identity as a process not a noun well and the the, the universal solvent or the antidote <laughs> that some of us are keen to talk about and think about is fine green consent that the if if somebody there it's projected that this de-identified uh, market is around 23 billion a year uh and that's with the 18 um elements uh, sapping it of a lot of its value if however you can identify if you can pinpoint the particular patient records you want and then um secure that patient's permission to use that data is going to be a lot more valuable and the regulatory exposure fades quickly if you can do that so the again the hypothesis here is uh, decentralized identities and fine-grained consents will go a long way to both solving the problem and adding value to the data at the same time i saw johan's hand was raised did you want to say anything johan yeah, I just wanted to add um, one thing. Um, uh, so this is not about this article, but uh, I just want to share what is happening in Sweden right now. I'm from Sweden myself, and um, the Swedish government, they have launched a committee to investigate uh, the possibilities to um, collect uh, user personal and personal health data for uh, research purposes. And uh, this committee will do this investigation, uh, I think to start now in the end of May and for one year, that will then be handed over to a government to, to take a decision. So basically what I'm saying is that governments are now looking into this as well, how they can uh, use uh, people's health data to enhance the healthcare system. So I would right. say that uh, uh, I think it's good, but it's also a bit scary because uh, what we see here is that uh, people's health data is being monetized uh, without them getting paid, I guess. And uh, now governments are stepping into this as well and uh, doing something similar. So um, I just want to share what is happening in Sweden. Sweden is, um, I would say, um, has been in the forefront for telemedicine and uh, a lot of development in this area. So that's why the government has started to start these initiatives, I guess. 
Well, yet another cross current in the, the uh, EU is the uh, pending Digital Services Act, uh, which will introduce another complexion. It's kind of a GDPR on steroids uh, movement. So whether or not that would trump the governments and then again, re-referencing the UK's action against Google, it's, it's just a very tormented area right now, but it's an actively tormented area. So there may be, um, we may be getting guidance from on high in the coming months. Yeah, and just to quickly add here, I think there's a comment in the article that says, um, but privacy experts say it shouldn't be up to IQV or any other for-profit company to, to decide how patients' personal information is used. Who are you to decide what benefits these people? What gives you the right to be judge, jury, and executioner? And it goes on to say, the common comparison of medical data to oil, a commodity to be freely traded, entirely misunderstands the unique nature of data. Oil gets burned and can't be reused, but information can be re reused. So it's very valuable, he said. Um, yeah, the way we need to deal with personal information is to look at it as an extension of the person. I think that's really true. I'm sure this won't be the last conversation about this type of, um, you know, misuse of data. Um, this is just a really good example of one. And I can, if anyone's interested in reading the full article, just send me an email. All right. Uh, next up here is from T Coin Telegram, and this is a genomics company which is exploring NFTs in hopes of advancing precision medicine. Gene NFTs is, I believe, the company name. Um, actually, Genetica, a genomics company catering to Asia Pacific region, recently partnered with Oasis Labs, a Web3 data management firm, to tokenize genomic profiles. Um, the co founder told Coin Telegraph that the goal behind the partnership is to advance precision medicine by giving patients data ownership and rights through gene nfts and you know most here already have heard about gene nfts to some degree uh, there's a number of startups in this space that have been trying to, to do this and are doing it um i don't know if there's anyone in here specifically now that is doing that but if there's any comments or thoughts people want to share about this article yeah feel free to jump in or raise your hand So here there's a comment. Uh, there are both financial and medical benefits associated with gene NFTs. Financial benefits involve revenue sharing. So users will get paid when third parties request to access their data. We are able to issue these payments automatically due to blockchain technology and smart contracts. I agree, but you know, actually doing it and properly and within regulation is harder uh, than it sounds, I think but I hope it works out and we'll be following this one too. Anyone familiar with this group or organization? Okay. It does also mention um, Robert Chu from Ablima. So that's a company that's working on a data platform for personalized medicine, you know, kind of focus on clinical trials as well. Um, so, yeah. All right. Uh, my final article here, actually, kind of a good segue into Emblema, uh, is that they are, the company is partnering with CDISC. CDISC is, uh, I think, clinical data. They're an SDO, standards body, national standards body for um, uh, clinical information, other than other than healthcare, HL7. Yes. Thanks, Jim. Here we go. So they're establishing standards for experimental assays and bioinformatics protocols 
which aim at accelerating development and availability of new cell and gene therapies for patients. So this is a pretty big deal too, I think. Uh, it gives some, you know, I guess credentials or some additional backing uh, for emblema. So the collaboration will cover standards development in three areas. As I mentioned, protocols and experimental assays and bioinformatics pipelines for evidence generation and submission to regulatory regulation bodies. They're also going to be covering provenance and privacy with relation to the patient CGTP set data sets. And then, of course, longevity or longitudinal data linkage and patient engagement as well. So pretty exciting announcement. Looking forward to uh, seeing how that plays out as well. All right, and a few educational nuggets. And uh, I try to separate industry news from educational nuggets. And educational nuggets is more, I don't know, I guess um, there's more content typically. It's longer and not specific to like a, a news sort of current events type of thing. Um, this was a HBR, Harvard Business Review article about telehealth and just stating how um, telehealth is still, where is it? Here we go. The telehealth era is just beginning. So it goes on to discuss, you know, the evolution of telehealth and telemedicine. Um, and then it talks about some of the opportunities, more of like the low hanging fruit opportunities for telehealth, because you know, when people say telehealth, there's so much involved. Um, but I think this article does a good job focusing on very specific opportunities that are, you know, low hanging fruit, in my opinion. So the first opportunity is to reduce expensive and unnecessary trips to the ER. For urgent care, telehealth can work really well, especially if you, you know, um, it's not something where you need to go to the ER, or if you're not sure, you can call someone talk to a doctor within five to 10 minutes instead of waiting two hours in an ER. So that's really useful, I think. And I say all this in the context of how can Web3 technologies be applied to these opportunities as well in the same way. Um, the second opportunity was to reverse America's chronic disease crisis, doing so by you know having um, more frequent communications with you know, NPs, doctors uh, about their conditions and being able to routinely speak with them instead of meeting with them less uh, frequently. A third opportunity was to address disparities in healthcare. Uh, so being able to, be, you know, anyone being able to use telehealth, I think that's helpful because no matter where you are, you can have access to um, a doctor, hopefully. Fourth opportunity is to make specialty care faster and more efficient. So just the initial process of talking to a specialist can be more streamlined with virtual care. Fifth opportunity was to provide access to the best doctors. Again, second opinions via virtual care is really useful. Uh, and then you can access doctors that are far away from you. You don't have to be in the same region as them. Yeah, I think those are the five and then they talk about adoption and how things have been developing with partnerships um and how you can do it you know create a successful telehealth program in your organization so pretty interesting i thought and that's your first educational nugget here uh the next article i found was about designing uh, token economics or economies so this is something that has been it's still a being worked on. It's not been, there's no standard for tokenizing an economy yet. I think uh, there's a lot of good information in here about, you know, the design of your token, um, which protocols, how tokens, you know, what are protocols, tokens, DAO, so they define them here. And for companies, they discuss how different protocols can work or not work. Um, both companies and protocols are trying to coordinate human and financial capital to accomplish a set of goals. You know, we can agree on that. And then 
a company's main goal is to produce a return on capital invested. Many protocols certainly share a similar goal for generating profits, but these objectives tend to be much more diverse from maintaining a piece of public digital infrastructure to creating one of the most cost efficient lending platforms in the world. So they talk about existing DAOs and how they work. Um, there's a section on governance, da data ownership, and just really some good stuff for everyone to, to dive into if you're interested here. They compare protocols to countries. Uh, good references. So has anyone designed a token economy successfully here that I'd like to share? I think that would be a great conversation to have maybe at a future meeting. Um, so if you have, if you or someone you know has done that, would love to have them, you know, in this meeting, just discuss how some of their challenges and successes, I think it'd be really interesting for all of us really. Ray, since we are nearing the top of the hour, I just wanted to um, point everyone to the chat where I provided a link to my latest academic publication. This is with Texas A&M University and Texas A&M Health Sciences Center. And it's um, about using blockchain to create a clinical genomic registry. While this is just an early model published with my friends and colleagues at Texas A&M, um, the most important takeaway for this group is that this is an extremely conservative university. And it's very exciting that they are seeing the benefit of blockchain technologies. In this case, it would be managing dynamic consent for um, a registry. And I, I can't tell you how many conversations I had to have with their privacy officers, with different regulatory officials. And it's exciting to see acceptance and enthusiasm for utilizing blockchain. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that, Wendy. I'll put that in the agenda as well for just stuff for people to read afterwards, I think. Um, and I think there's a few other articles or links people shared. So I'm happy to include those too. Um, and yep, that was pretty much it. The last educational nugget was my latest episode on Health Unchained. I interviewed trial CEO Hadil S. Spa, and they're working on clinical trial documentation via Web3 and blockchain. So check that out if you have the time. And we have a minute left. So I just wanted to thank everyone for joining again and uh, participating. You know, we have these meetings every two weeks. So the next one will be on let's see here, June 8th. So looking forward to seeing you all and uh, more people next time. And if there's any articles or content you want me to share, let me know. Uh, I've shared my email in the chat as well. Or you can even just make a comment in here directly in the next agenda page, which I'll create for, for the next meeting. So again, thank you all. Appreciate it. Thank you. That's right. Thank you.